Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm here with Eric Rule from Hazleton uh, National Golf Club and welcome to the sixth in a series of AGIF sustainability webinars. In the coming months, every week, we continue to deliver webinars on turf and club management with industry leaders to supply career building information to professionals in Asia. The Asia Pacific, uh, the Asia Golf Industry Federation is a non-for-profit membership federation comprised of suppliers and facilities in the turf, club and sports industry. And the federation focuses on building sustainable practices, both in environmental and economic aspects throughout the Asia Pacific region. We strongly believe that the key in the development of the sustainable industry is the education and empowerment of the professionals in the industry, and hence is why we're running webinars with people like Eric and experts speaking today. We have developed the AGIF certificate in greenskeeping, which is supported by the RNA and five AGIF member organizations. The CIG focuses on developing the skill set of greenkeepers, turf professionals throughout Asia. We also focus on club management education as a partner of the Club Management Association of America. We have rolled out education in Asia for the pathway to the certified club manager degree. The CCM is considered the gold standard in club management industry globally and managers in Asia now can achieve the necessary education here in Asia as a result of this partnership with the CMAA. It is vital to have strong partners in implementing education throughout Asia, and our education is recognized for credits from the PGA of America, the PGA of GB in Ireland, the PGA of Australia, the PGA of Japan, the Club Management Association of America, and the GCSAA. Due to travel restrictions from the COVID-19 pandemic, webinars are the only way that we can continue to deliver education at the moment. We'll resume ed event education when travel restrictions ease, and we'll keep you posted as this develops. Over the last few months, we have spent a lot of time improving our digital offering and membership benefits. For more information, please log on to www.agif.asia, as well as our LinkedIn and Facebook company pages. Please also sign up for our weekly newsletter to join the 10,000 industry contacts in receiving a weekly industry update. Lastly, the AGIF is a non-for-profit federation. And now more than ever, we rely upon membership dues to operate. So if you like what we do, and you think that your facility or company can benefit from communicating with the industry, please note that our membership benefits are substantial and can be seen on our website under AGIF membership benefits. Please take a look. And if you're already an AGIF member, thank you very much. Your ongoing support is greatly appreciated. On to some housekeeping issues. Uh, Eric will present on the topic for roughly 60 minutes, and we will have a 30 minute uh, Q&A after that. The chat buttons are on throughout, so please feel free to ask questions, which then we can voice back to Eric during the Q&A session. Now on to the main event and to introduce our speaker. Eric Rules is CCM, a certified club manager and a general manager of Hazleton National Golf Club. For 27 years, Eric served as the membership, served the membership of Oak Hill Country Club in Rochester, New York. Starting as the clubhouse manager in 1985, he oversaw the entire clubhouse operation for the 1989 United States Open Championship. After becoming the general manager in 1989, he aggressively and enthusiastically increased the standards of service to elevated, elevate Oak Hills to the elite level of clubs in the United States. He is known for mentoring and tutoring staff and has well, a well-earned respect from his team. Eric successfully led the club through the prestigious 31st Ryder Cup matches in 1995, the United States Amateur in 1998, the 2003 PGA Championship, 2008 Senior PGA Championship. Under his leadership, Oak Hill profited by more than $9 million in championship revenues. He has worked with all golf's governing bodies and has an excellent reputation and rapport with all of them. Eric developed and implemented many physical plant additions and renovations at Oak Hill to maintain the club's premier facilities. The crowning achievement was the full renovation of the seven, uh, 70,000 square foot 1926 English Tudor Clubhouse in 1997, which came on a budget, came in on budget and on time. He also oversaw the new construction of the 13,000 square foot sports complex, as well as the complete renovation of its irrigation and drainage system on both golf courses. He managed over 40 million on capital projects through over 20 years. All projects were completed on time and under budget. His vision of elevating Oak Hill to an elite, uh, uh, elite level club from a good golf club was recognized by Golf Digest in 2003 when it named Oak Hill the 10th best golf course in the country. 2000, 
uh, 10 Golf World Readers Poll ranked Oak Hill as the number one private club in America. It evaluated all the variables from the quality and condition of the course to the amenities offered, quality of food and service, and overall value provided to the golfer that make a golf facility the best it could be. After deciding to explore other ideas after 27 years, Eric accepted a position with Pacific Links in 2012, and he oversaw the construction of a world-class 27-hole golf course and 45,000 square foot clubhouse and operations were based on North American model of rules, dues, and operational standards. This project was completed in, 2000, in July of 2015 with a budget of $71 million. It was completed in six months late completed six months late due to early monsoons that required reshaping. However, it still came in $3 million under budget. He served as the interim manager for the Sleepy Howl Hollow Golf Club before moving to Hazleton National Golf Club in February of 2018. Since arriving at Hazleton, he has led the club in rewriting governance documents and procedures, hosted the K KPMG Women's PGA Championship last year, began a new strategic planning process and very successfully has managed the club during the COVID-19 pandemic. Eric has been very active in outside activities. He twice served as president of the New York State Club Managers Association of America and has also had other board, pressers, all other board positions in their ranks. He's been a guest lecturer at several hospitality schools throughout Northeastern United States and Northern China. He has served in the New York State Club Association board since 1996 and as secretary from 2004 to 2015. Other boards have included the Empire State Hospitality Workers' Compensation Trust, for, Trust Board, the Town of Gates Zoning Boards of Appeals, the, Serve, the Seneca Waterways Council, and the Boy Scouts of America. Quite a resume. Eric, thank you very much for your time and welcome. All right, well, thank you, Eric. And I uh, look forward to spending the next hour with everybody. You know, my, my record sounds a lot more impressive when somebody reads it uh, than when I write it for a resume. So uh, fortunately, I think I'm getting to the point in my life where I don't have to present that in a resume format very much anymore. But uh, I'm really happy to be with everybody today. Eric, do you want me to switch over yet or do you? Please do, please do. All right. Thank you. Okay, how's that look? Good. Hasn't appeared, hasn't appeared yet. Hasn't appeared yet. Uh, let's see. Still not? Not yet. Hmm. Okay, this is exactly what we did before. Let me start it again. It always works in rehearsal. Yeah, well, you know, you spend a little bit of time doing it. How about now? Um, unfortunately, no. Not yet. Okay. Well, let's see. Sorry. It is showing presenter view on my end. Uh, there we go. All right. Do you see the show? We can see the email, so we need to click on the PowerPoint to open that, I think. We see the email there. Yeah, yeah. There we go. 
How about that? And all we need is the full view, if you can manage that. We can see the presentation, so now just the full view. Still not, huh? Well, we saw it. It was just not in the full view. So if you go to, yeah, I can see it here down at the bottom of your screen. There we go. All right. Close enough. Um, Which can you see? Uh, we can see traditional membership dues model. So we don't see your first slide. And we see the, yeah, nickels and dimes are right there. Okay. So I think, you know, we've got a, we've got, Two sides. It's still we can see it. It's good enough. Can you see the full one now? Pretty much. Yeah, we can see the full one now. We're all set to go. All right. There we go, okay. Eric. Thank you very much. All right. Sorry for that, everybody. It worked perfectly when we were talking about a little while ago. Um, when Eric called me uh, a couple weeks ago now um, and asked me if I had any thoughts about uh, presenting a topic on sustainability. This topic came right up because we just implemented this at Hazeltine National Golf Club and it's, it's something that I think is going to be revolutionary in many ways um, in the world. I think the, the US club market is going to see more and more of this. And really the pandemic is, is one of the reasons why I think it's uh, uh, really going to be a really cool, cool aspect. Um, our members uh, have gotten um, nickel and dimed for years. The traditional model of a, of a club is uh, the budgeting model really comes around to dues and those dues are used to support fixed operations. Um, members come to the golf course and don't pay any greens fee. They pay for their gas obviously and transportation, but um, you know, they really don't pay anything to play golf. And yet we turn around in the restaurant and we charge people, you know, a, a fairly good premium to be able to come to their club as an owner and dine. Uh, so in addition to, you know, the dining aspect of it, we charge them for lockers. We charge them for uh, range fees. We charge them for bag storage. So it's all those kind of things that are nickel and diming. And yet with the pandemic, we were held back. We couldn't put some of those charges through because how can you charge somebody for bag storage if they can't bring their bag out to the club or if they can't use the range? Um, we were precluded from that for quite a while as many of you were. So it really was something that we pushed into gear when we got into March. We wanted to build a sustainable model that allowed us to be able to make sure that, that our, our, uh, the things that our members wanted were covered. So we had five reasons that we were looking for to, um, uh, to do. And the first was to stop the, the comments about nickel and diamond. Um, you know, all those little things that were added on, we wanted to roll that into dues. Not only does it build our dues to a higher level than what the uh, normal operation is, but each year as we increase those dues, we're increasing a bigger base if we include all those things in. So it was, it was something that uh, I've been working on for probably close to a year and really in earnest for the last seven months. We also wanted to create an environment where our members were rewarded for using the club. We have a minimum, as, as some of you do in Asia, um, that requires people to come to the club and use it. And I hate minimums. I hate forcing people to come to the club. So the, um, the aspect of getting rid of the minimum really was something that I think helped us to solve this project. We also wanted to fix some of our P&L problems that Hazeltine had done. They had taken all of their initiation fee and moved them up to the top line with dues. And they were using initiation fees to try to balance their budget. And we wanted to get away from using it up at the top line. 
move it down to the capital line so we had more money to be able to spend on capital projects. Uh, we also wanted to stabilize that due so we didn't have the variations from things like a pandemic. Our banquet revenue is out the window this year. We had uh, one wedding. We normally have somewhere in the neighborhood of 19. Uh, next year we have 27 and all 27 of those are coming from the end of, or from the end of May until the end of the year, if we can even get those done. So we wanted to stabilize that, some of those things out and put them into dues. And we also wanted to create a capital reserve that we could use to pay for things like our roof that we weren't gonna have budgeted. Uh, we wanted to be able to build that reserve up into the millions of dollars so that we could replace things like boilers and roofs and, and uh, you know, major capital projects that, that we had going. So fixing the nickel and diming was the major concern. And what are those add-on fees that we have and why do we have them? We do them in Minnesota because everybody wants to have the lowest dues because membership, you know, there's very few clubs that are full of members right now. So they want to have lower dues to attract more members and they wanted to be competitive in the market. So those are the, those are the reasons that we have the add-on fees. And we felt that by saying Hazeltine is, is known worldwide for its golf uh, competitions, Hazeltine and Oak Hill were the two clubs that led through the 80s, 90s, and 2000s for major championships. So I'm familiar with that. We don't want to be the cheapest club in town. We want to be the best club in town. So the miscellaneous other add-on fees that Hazeltine charges are golf bag storage, range fees, locker fees, minimum spending, food and beverage service charges. Uh, everybody, I think you're all familiar that when you have uh, a, a, you eat in the dining room, there's a 15 or 20 or 18% service charge that's added. We felt by looking at that, by slimming down our, our offerings to our members and having a lower priced a la carte menu for them that we could really entice people to come to the club which would negate our need for minimum spending and also by rolling the service charges into dues we are also building up that base so that when we do increase dues we are increase a bigger base and have more money so things like handicap fees and tea time programs those were all passed on to our members so their their comments about uh, you know, being nickeled and dimed really added up. Then we looked at some of the other contributions that we go to the members for during the course of the year. Uh, the Caddy Scholarship Program, the holiday funds for the staff, and we had other requests throughout the year. Um, you know, we had outside groups that would ask for donations from our members, outings that would come in and want our members to play into it. So, we looked at all these things, we made a decision as to what we were going to incorporate into our dues. Some of the things made it, some of the things didn't. So um, this plan, as you will see as we go through, um, I think it makes a lot of sense for many, many clubs in the US to really start thinking about. If you're a premier club, offer premier services, and it's gonna cost more, but in the long term, you'll see at the end, it actually saves the members money. So the next aspect that we wanted to look at, our current dues model, uh, we pay somewhere in the neighborhood of $8,328, and this is for a full regular member of the club. There's other various categories, but just to highlight it, they were tacked on an annual fee of 190 US dollars. They were tacked on a locker fee for uh, the first member of 190, the second member for a one-time um, locker fee uh, of 190, the bag storage, same for the second member in the family, and the handicap fee, and all those things added together add another $1,000 to the dues, um, which really, you know, when we say we, we charge members $8,328, we really charge them with capital dues and these add-on fees close to $11,200. $11, we also had our minimum, which was 1,200. So if you came to the club, you were spending $1,240 $1, $1, a 
a, uh, a month, excuse me, uh, yeah, $12,400 a year in dues and fees and charges. So we wanted to think, how do we get out of the box? How do we get those numbers so that we can do something totally different? And totally different was the theme of what we were looking at. Um, we all knew that we could do lower prices and have our, uh, our food costs go down, but we really looked at this from a different perspective. So how could we get the members to use the club more than what they used it for now? And the things that we looked at were, hey, um, we have this minimum. We force people to come to the club every two weeks at the end of the two week cycle and end of the one month cycle, we would have everybody rush in on the last day or two to try to use their minimum. And that to me just didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, we should be looking at food as an amenity. How can we charge an owner so much for, you know, a, a burger, 14, 15, $18 for a burger, when the cost of that burger is maybe three or four bucks. And you know, it just didn't seem right to me that, that if we're looking at this whole total package, how can we make it different? So if we looked at all the club activities as an amenity, like we do with the golf course, you come out, you join as a member, you come out and you play golf and uh, you don't pay it, a green fee to go out and play golf. You pay if you get a cart, you pay if you use some other aspect other than the club. So we thought let's look at food and beverage as an amenity. And I know many people have talked about this in the industry around, around the world, but if we can move some of these fees into dues, make that more sustainable. So if we have a bad month, we can move ahead and we don't have to worry too much about what that impact is. Um, we wanted to give the members a better value. Uh, if you are paying X and a lot of things are included, the more you use the club, the lower your effective dues become. We also wanted to look at our margins and say, hey, if we're charging an owner for this, what would be fair? And, you know, we looked at a model uh, presented by Monterey Peninsula Country Club which they had their, their food and beverage at cost plus 20%. So it made sense to us to say, how can we do this and what can we make happen? So we did look at the minimum. We did say the owners are, are paying too much money. How can we do this differently? So we moved all of our fixed costs from the restaurant into our dues, which amounted to about $175 a month premium. We took all of those add-on charges and moved them into dues. And we decided that we were gonna charge just 20% on food, 50% uh, on beverage, because we don't wanna encourage too many people to drink too much. And then uh, we wanted to look at our merchandise sales as well and say, how can we give our members value and how can we cover those costs? And we put, it was about $19 for, uh, uh, merch, or for the merchandise side and about $175 for the food and beverage side. So by doing those types of things and by looking at what our service charge and our minimums netted us, we looked at the unspent minimum. Um, we looked at the service charges, which amounted to about $250,000 a year on our, uh, both on our beverage, on our snack bar, our Bev Hut and our member dining. And we rolled that into this dues number. Um, we had a lost deviation when we did all this of about a million dollars and divided by all of our members on a monthly basis that worked out to about $175. The benefit is if you're, this is our old pricing on the grilled Angus filet, two teriyaki salmon, a, a wimpy burger, which is our burger, uh, our food, beverages there. You can see that totaled up to about $75. The whole food and beverage experience was $273 plus a service charge of 18%. Totaled up to about $322 and with taxes it's $344.
as we looked at it, we said, okay, it costs plus 20% on our, on our food and cost plus 50% on our alcoholic beverages. We can bring that down to $121. There's not gonna be a service charge because we rolled that into dues. Taxes are actually gonna be less because we're charging less money. So that's helping the members too. So that $344 check moved down to $131, saving a member $213. So we set our, our dues level with all those items in it. We set it at a little bit more than what the average member pays so that we try to get the members out here two or three times uh, more a month. So between, we looked at everybody's spending analysis, we did a, a theoretical spending analysis based on this new model. And we have about uh, one quarter of the members that are actually at or below or actually saving money in their effective dues rate versus the other three quarters in each dues category who will have to spend a little bit to get into that category, but with lower prices, better service, better food. We replaced our chef last year and really did something kind of unique with that. Um, we can really come up with a unique experience. And a number of our members said to us, well, what about the, the guest that comes from out of the club and, and they're going to pay the same price that we're going to pay? And I said, no, we're gonna charge them 100% premium. Um, and then we kind of move this into a couple of other dues categories that, that non-resident members, we didn't feel it was right to charge them $175. Uh, for the food and beverage per month. So we're gonna put them in this new non-member uh, pricing or uh, as we're gonna refer to it, a dining surcharge and charge those members that are not members and those people that come in as guests, we're gonna charge them 100%. So their new effective bill is still about $80 less than what the old effective bill was. So we're really excited about how this model has come together. We also said, well, what other benefits can we give to our membership that allow us to, again, give a perceived value add? So we looked at our Bev Hut and our Turn Bar, uh, one's out on the golf course, one's adjacent to the clubhouse, and we figured out how much our non-alcoholic food and beverage sales were, and we took that cost and we allocated that to this dues model. So that was about another $11 that we added to the dues. And now we're not gonna charge our members for any food and beverage, non-alcoholic beverage out on the golf course. And we'll charge them for beers and wine and cocktails on the golf course. We'll charge them the cost plus 50%. So this whole model is totally different but it provides benefit to our members to use the club because their effective dues are going down. They're paying for something, so they're going to want to, to take advantage of it. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Minnesota in the Midwest, but it's a very fiscally conservative climate. As you can tell, they were using their initiation fees to pay for operations. Um, and now we're moving that out and we're, they're starting to see the value in the long-term business model that this will present. And we'll go through that in a minute. But we also looked at our uh, uh, member spending analysis and we said, okay, what about merchandise? You know, our merchandise is about a 65% cost of goods. We said, what if we take that down to this 20% number as well? And any guests that come in will have a, you know, a normal markup for our guests. And the SKU ticket would be able to reflect a member price and a non-member price. So those non-members would be looking at it saying, geez, you know, look what I, if I was a, if I was a member of the club, this is what I would be spending or paying for, for this certain thing. Now we've, we've set up displays in our golf shop so that our members can see this all starts on January 1st. So we said to our members, okay, um, this is gonna start January 1st. 
here's a display that shows you what you're paying for these items now. And here's a display that shows what you will be paying for those items then. We also are in the midst of having specialty dinners that our board members are attending on our slower nights of the week, which are Wednesdays and Thursdays. And we're presenting to our, our members that come a check at the end of their meal, and they're only paying for the new pricing model uh, at these special dinners. And when we give them their brochure, and their brochure has all the details of how this is being spent, uh, in that brochure is a check that on one side of the check, it shows what the cost of their meal was under the old model and what the cost is under the new model. Because we have 500 or so members that are supporting this, they are all making our dues um, consistent and stable. And we also have much of this um, overhead built into our dues so that really we don't have a lot of variable income in our food and beverage operation anymore. We still have banquets, which are gonna be at the regular price and the regular service charge. But as far as our a la carte goes, our a la carte is, uh, our a la carte is going to be, let's say that we increase our sales by $100,000. With this 20% premium, it's only going to be about a $20,000 swing. So we don't have a huge uh, flux of our, of our income, our variable income, Whereas if we have the pandemic, we lost somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.3 million in food and beverage between April or between middle of March and uh, the middle of July. So I think these opportunities are, uh, you know, the same goes through for the uh, golf merchandise program. We're going to lose about $120,000 and we split that over all the members. It only ends up being about $19,000. So we looked at all of our member spending and we did these analysis and we have it for every member. If they wanna call and say, where do I rank in this bell curve? Am I at the top? Am I actually saving money? How much do I have to spend? And we did a bunch of analysis and if a member calls us and wants to know what that means, we have that information. We can show them and we added it to our, to our, uh, our dues model so that we can say, here's what your dues were, here's what your spending is, and here's what it's going to be under the new plan. Things like golf carts and guests don't really come into play because there's no difference there. And I don't think we want to give golf carts away for free and include that because it's one of those things that we want to get. Uh, we want to have less golf carts on the golf course because we are a walking golf course and people perceive that um, as a... Uh, as a benefit to be a walking golf course. So what did this do to our dues? So uh, up here, and I'll use my pointer because I'm not quite sure what happened with our, with our uh, uh, presentation. And hopefully you can all see this. Um, our dues were in this $694. This, these are three categories of golfers. Our regular golfers, our corporate and our young executive pay this $94. And then I guess other categories are spread out over this way. So the regular golfers, $694 plus $175 a month for our food and beverage program. Our golf shop merchandise is adds six or $19 to it. Our range fee added $16. The locker fee and bag storage, we're only charging in the dues to avoid nickel and diming, we're charging the first member of the club for a locker and bag storage. If the second member of the club wants to do it, that will be an add-on, but it also benefits those single members. We didn't want to charge them twice. Then we also had an issue where everybody feels that they can't get on the T-sheet. And we wanted to say some aspect of this, we wanted to have uh, some of our guest play reduced. And so we threw in this sponsored guest play. We wanted to reduce that. We took our fee up. We also included some dollars for our members to pay in dues to be able to say, hey, you wanted less activity on the golf sheet, on this T-sheet. 
So we've added some money to this dues program to be able to reduce our guest play. That'll get a lot of play that we feel is a, is a good, important aspect. Every member gets charged a handicap fee through the gym system. And uh, we wanted to pass that along. We didn't, the club didn't need it in the past. They had passed it along, but it was, you know, a one-time uh, fee. And this way, by only putting it in in dues, for two people in your family, it's $7 per member per month. And that really low, you know, it, it keeps that, it gets rid of that nickel and dime effect, but it also keeps that dues level moving up. So our new operating dues, uh, and, excuse me, and we also added our employee holiday fund. So every year we would go to our members and say, hey, you know, your staff did a great job this year. You spent X number of dollars in, in uh, food and beverage this year. And here's a suggested contribution to our employee holiday fund. By including this into our uh, dues calculation, we have, we're gonna use that fund to pay for an employee party at the end of the year and also to pay bonuses. We also are generating an extra 15 or $18,000 in dues to be able to pay for those things than we had in the past. So we'll be able to give a better holiday bonus and we'll be able to give a, a pretty good holiday party. So that added on $274 to our dues. And then we looked at each area and we said, geez, this area seems to be way out of whack. This area is really low. They should pay more. This area, you know, we're gonna lose 60% of our members at that rate. So we use this adjustment to even out dues to be able to get different numbers that we felt were palatable. So our new operating dues per regular member fell to this level. So our members now are going to pay $156 plus $152 in capital dues for a total of $1,208. It's not the highest dues in the Minneapolis market, but it's close. And overall, they'll be paying $14,497 versus their two 2020 dues that we talked about in the beginning of $1,182 plus their minimum. So there's some other charges in there or about $3,300 more in dues. Down at the bottom is our calculated average spend. So in 20, uh, excuse me, these are actually reversed. So in 2020, the average spend was $5,262. That included their, um, their average spending for everything, food and beverage, uh, golf merchandise down here. So now with the new calculation for 2021, it's $2,200 less than what they spent this is just spending, not including dues. It's $2,200 less than what they spent in the average over the previous two years. So the net increase in dues and spending is $1,082. But remember with our pricing model that I showed you on the, uh, the fictitious check, they're gonna be saving a tremendous amount of money if they just come out to the club twice a week. And we presented that to them and most members have felt that that really is a benefit. So here is what the actual spending is, and I've got the two numbers fixed here. Our 2020 average spend was $1,644. The proposed 2021 spend is $1,756, about 1,082 more. But again, if they use the dining room and come to the club, they're going to actually be saving money as they move down the road. So you might say, what, you know, how does this really fix um, some of the other problems that I referred to in the beginning when I talked about our operational, uh, using capital for operational purposes. So we looked at that a lot. We did a capital reserve study and we, we, we realize you know our building is only 10 years old but they haven't really invested a lot into it over the last 10 years the golf course has got some things that need to be fixed uh the you know capital reserves for the maintenance facility is relatively new 
So we don't have a lot of capital expenditures to fix things, but we wanted to be able to have it for when the uh, golf course, uh, the roof on the clubhouse goes, or the, you know, we get a tornado. We had a hailstorm a couple weeks ago with a fair amount of damage to some of our electrical equipment on the roof. So we wanted to be able to have reserves to be able to fix that. So this is a picture of what our operations look like currently, proposed for 2021, moving out to 2024. And you can see that the club used all, well, essentially they used all of their initiation fees in previous years to come to the dues and initiation line and then had all of their expenses coming down and mis miscellaneous income, et cetera, to come up with a bottom line of about $108,000. But we're using a loss, but we're using $800,000 of initiation fees to do that. So what we decided to do was slowly and gradually over time, get the initiation fees out of dues essentially, and move that down to capital. So you can see as I go across the line here, we have 800,000 in 2021, 500,000 in 2022, 200,000 in 2023, and eventually we get zero in 2024. And our bottom line is going up while we're doing that. That is the compound effect of dues and how we feel sustainability is going to occur at Hazeltine in the future. So where did that $800,000 go? This is down at the capital side, capital funding. These were the operating numbers that I just showed you at the, at the bottom line before up here. So as we move down, you can see our excess cash. We have, we're gonna have about $600,000 in capital reserve from this year. That is what this 600 is. Our capital dues are about 613,000. This initiation fee line right here, we had $800,000 in initiation. <coughs> we anticipate that we're gonna have about 70,000 more than that $800,000 in 2021. So we put that into 2021. And then you can see that where the capital line up above went down to zero down here, it's going in the opposite direction. And by year 2024, all of this initiation fee is falling to our capital reserve. This is our mortgage principal and interest, 259.5. That stays constant throughout the four years. And then down here, our normal capital spending, which should be in the seven or $800,000 range based on our club, is put in here at roughly anywhere from $330,000 to $500,000. But we also are able to start putting money away in year two into a capital reserve fund. And this is just going right to the balance sheet. We're not planning on spending that. So as you can see, with this $600,000 infusion from our cash from this year, we're going to have a balance in our capital fund of about 424, or 524,000, less our loss, which we plan the loss, about 415,000, which comes up to our excess cash and that whole cycle starts again. So where we were not even building up a capital reserve, and we were only spending about 300 to 500,000 in capital, our total operations and capital proceeds by year 2024 are $1.7 million. So looking at this whole thing, you can see that there's a big paradigm shift in what we're looking at and how we're looking to spend it. Um, we just finished a capital spending plan, which would be about $12 million, excuse me, over the next 10 years. So this plan generates two thirds of that amount during that 10 years. And we'll have to assess the members for some of these bigger projects, but we can spend two thirds of what they wanted to do over 10 years out of cash based on the timing that we 
that we have uh, laid out in this plan. So as we're looking through this, uh, we presented to the membership for the extra dues, which they will soon forget. It might take one or two years for them to forget about it. But for that little extra incremental amount of dues, you are now not going to be nickel and dimed. We're not going to solicit you for employee and or caddy funds. We're not going to have minimums. We're not going to have service charges. We're going to have free food and non-alcoholic beverages on the golf course. We're going to have food and wine at 20% over cost. We're going to have alcoholic beverages at 50% over cost. You're going to have a more stable bill over the year because you're not going to have all these add-on uh, service charges, um, unused minimum charges. You're not going to have any of that. You're going to have your merchandise at cost plus 20%. And we're going to be able to provide the new bells and whistles or toys as one of our, as our vice president likes to call it in capital improvements that many members in the club through our survey have indicated they wanted. Our survey indicated that they wanted us to reduce debt. Well, you can see that Right now we have about three and a quarter million dollars in debt. We can't do $12 million worth of projects in a short period of time without debt. And debt's not bad. There's nothing wrong with debt as long as you can pay the principal and interest and it works through that. So we believe that this is kind of revolutionary being able to put all this stuff together keep our memberships satisfied, give them some things back. And, you know, we do have an affluent membership. 70% uh, of our membership uh, makes over three quarters of a million dollars a year. We are, have been known as a working man's club in Minneapolis area. But, you know, when you got three quarters of your membership making over 300 or $750,000 a year, that is really a pretty aggressive uh, membership number to be working off of. And we think that this increase of about three, close to $3,000 a year is something that our membership will take. We've built attrition numbers. In, we've got an attrition number on our regular membership of about 3%, uh, about 8% of our senior membership and roughly 20% of our uh, social membership. So we've done a lot of work. We've done a lot of analysis. Um, we feel that this is on the cutting edge of where club finances are gonna go in the future because we're building this stable dues model. And um, I think in our board feels that this is something that Hazeltine is gonna benefit from for many years. That capital, <clears throat> uh, that capital improvement number is just gonna keep going up because we are building off that increase of incremental dues every year. So we've added close to $2 million in dues over the next, well, by the end of next year, our dues increase will be over $2 million. So that's, that's kind of my presentation. Um, I know we have a lot of time for questions and answers. Um, I am going to get rid of this and hopefully get rid of that. And bring this back up. So what questions and answers can I get for everybody? All right, you still have your desktop icon on, so yeah, we have great questions. And thanks very much uh, for the great presentation and, and, and opening the books. I mean, it's, it's great to see the numbers behind the strategy. So it's very much appreciated. And I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of thoughts being spurred by this presentation.
Uh, although the, the U.S. private market, uh, club market, is a little different in some respects than the Asian one, but the principles still remain the same uh, as far as consolidating these. Uh, we do have some questions. Um, let me see if I can close it here. <clears throat> okay. Let's get out of this. Do I need to stop sharing it? Yeah, stop sharing would probably do there it. Go. There we go. How's Great. <laughs> All right. So we have a question from India. India from Nikhil, and it's more on the golf course side of the business because he's superintendent sure. there. Um, yeah. How do you bridge the gap in membership fee structure when half of the membership may be happy with average conditions on the golf course and the other half might want uh, world-class playing conditions, which you're renowned for? Uh, Hazeltine is a golfer's club. We mm -hmm. have world-class conditions all the time. Uh, we're going to, we open the golf course when the golf course is ready and we close the golf course. We're going to close the golf course next Saturday is our last day, even though we're projected to have what, what we all would consider playable conditions. We are closing the golf course. Our members join Hazel team because they want to play the game the way it was meant to be played. They want to walk. They mm -hmm. want to play by the rules. Um, we have more USGA certified rules officials at Hazeltine than any other club in the United States. Um, so our members all are here for the golf course. And that's what makes some of this capital improvement difficult because they, they really want the golf course. And I was brought in to make it uh, more of a full club model than just a golf course model. So we have a lot of improvements that we have to make. A lot of them are not related to the golf course, and that's going to be a challenge. So there is no such thing as average conditions. It's always world-class play at, at Hizzleton, which is... I would say there are no average conditions <laughs> at Hazeltine. Fantastic. Um, we have about a million nine budget for 18 holes. We right. have the golf course sits on about 180 acres, and then there's another 220 acres uh, adjacent to the club, which is the main reason why we attract major championships. Fantastic. We have another question uh, from Anit in India. He's asking on slide 21, where you have shown the reduction of pricing, you have also considered the amendment in the original recipe. Have you also considered the amendment in the original recipe in portion size? Uh, because any food items you've reduced in pricing, by 56%, meaning have, your, have you adjusted your serving sizes, et cetera? No, we're gonna provide the same serving sizes that we provided before. Um, we're just taking that cost of that plate and just adding 20%. So we're not worrying about markup for, you know, a 42 or a 50% food cost or whatever that is. So if it costs us, uh, you know, $3 for a Wimpy burger, plus 20%, you know, you're only talking another 60 cents for the Wimpy Burger to cover that. We are giving our members the same portion, possibly even bigger portions, uh, because our costs can actually be reduced. Um, and, and again, you're only paying 20%. So a, a prime steak that might cost us $65 to put out on a plate that only costs us 18, you're adding 20% to that. So it's only another three or $4, three or $4 that you're adding to that 18 bucks. So we don't have to change our portion sizes and everything will be at cost plus 20%. Okay. We have another uh, a question from uh, Spencer, who's our communications officer. And he says, asked, based on your experience of working in Asia, do you think this financial model can be embraced by owners operators in the region? Well, um, quite frankly, I, I would think it's possible. I think that it's got to be uh, geared in Asia anyway, more towards a wealthier club. I, I don't yep. know if, if a uh, smaller scale club would be able to pull this off. 
but um, you know, unfortunately, I never got to actually operate the club uh, with a membership. Uh, we, um, as you're all aware, we all got booted out of China when the moratorium went into mm. place. But mm. I can see it working. I think, you know, we talked about this model a little bit at the 27 Club, but yeah. we weren't quite at the point. We, we wanted to sell memberships there, but we weren't really ready to look at the other six or seven clubs that we were going to incorporate. So we never got to it, but I think it could work at a higher scale uh, club. Yeah, I mean, uh, I like, I love your icon, uh, nickel and diming with the, the guy being crushed by the, the coins. I, I think uh, that's a, it's a multinational phrase, whether you're being crushed by the rupiah or the, or the dong, etc. So, you know, my observation of clubs seen out here is the model consolidating those costs, and it would be for more of a private member club, but it right. would be a popular way to do it, because you're, you're not nickel and diming them. And you, you're, right. It, I guess that comes up to the, the communication aspect and I'll just jump into that because that's what I was intrigued with. So you surveyed the members and then you also prepared a spreadsheet for each one of them to be able to compare. Do you, right. did, you, did you work through committees? Do you have committees now or do you basically uh, have a relationship? How did that work? This pretty much stayed at the board level at this point. We just went to the finance committee and explained to them what we were going to do uh, we showed them our model, um, but it really developed from the board, and um, I, I was pretty much the driver of most of the information that we went through. I think that uh, people don't like to see, you know, if you're buying an airline ticket today, and you see a ticket for $250, um, and then you go in and it says, oh, and if you want to pick your seat, it's another $35. And if you want to check your bag, it's another $30 per bag. And if you want to check a second bag, it might be 30 and the second one might be 45. All of a sudden that $250 airline ticket becomes 500 bucks. Yeah. And you're like, why are they doing this? I think people hate that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like going to buy a car and they just say, well, you can have rust proofing and you can get an extended warranty and you can get this. Right. And you're getting frustrated more and more and more with all that add up. By consolidating it, if I want to pay $500 for the seat, tell me it's 500 bucks and don't turn around and throw on all these extras to make it happen. And your, your observation is that this is quite revolutionary in even the U.S. private club industry to, to take a look at doing this. And the old model that you exhibited before is the add-ons are normal or uh, standard? The in the yeah, I think the add-ons are normal. Uh, you know, I know what Oak Hill it was. I know what Sleepy Hollow it was. Um, I think taking the food and beverage, getting rid of the minimum, getting rid of the service charge and saying, hey, all of our members are enjoying the benefits of what we're trying to put together. So spread it across to everybody and say, hey, there is no better restaurant in town for, for quality of food. We're, you know, we're, we're well outside of Minneapolis, so we're not competing with, with the city. But if your fixed costs, are, it's just like your golf course. You don't pay extra because you got 12 people on the ground screw versus 30. You don't pay extra in the dining room. Our staff is being paid on a flat wage. We have waitresses making anywhere between 28 and $40 an hour. And they're gonna be made whole in this scenario. So all of those fixed costs drop down. I assume that after a year or two that we'll shake out on where the labor is. Um, we've built about a 30% increase in volume into our first year model. And I think once we get through that first year, we'll have a pretty good feel. But knowing what our labor has been this year in the pandemic in previous years in normal operations, I think we'll be able to absorb about a 50% increase without a huge increase in labor. Uh, another question from Anit in India about the F&B is on slide 31. How are your F&B costs coming down as what I understand it has a variable cost element, barring fixed costs on salaries, which you probably just addressed, which is linked to sales. Based on your suggestions, I understand the F&B sales revenue will get affected due to reduction in prices, but assume the volume will for sure go up. 
and so is the cost. <clears throat> what will eventually that will eventually shrink your profit margins? Well, the profit margin should actually be going in the other direction because. A, we still have our banquet operation, which is going to be at regular full price plus service charge. We've made some adjustments in that area. I think that's going to be going up. But also, you know, we've got a 6% increase built across the board in sales volume, even though it's not a lot of money. You can see our food and beverage only changes by fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year um, in each one of those years. But that's an effect of the 20% service charge or 20% premium that we're charging to food and beverage. So the volume goes up, but not exponentially. We've got an increase in our sales. We've got an increase in banquet operations. So, you know, it, it's pretty flat line, but it's going in an upward or a better, better direction. And to be clear, this is only for individual uh, expenditure. It doesn't apply banqueting and when you're doing weddings and other aspects and larger no. events. No. Uh, our no. golf events will be at uh, a full price. Yeah. Um, it's really only our dining mm -hmm. and okay. our, you know, our Bev Hut, that, that's all free. Food and non-alcoholic beverages is free. Right. I, I'm assuming that we're going to take a hit on that in year one because everybody's going to say, up. Oh, I can get six Gatorades when I go by the snack bar, or I can get five sliders that we make out there on a daily basis. Um, I assume that first year it's going to be a bit of a challenge, but after that it'll level out. Um, we are confident that, you know, this is a trend that I believe incorporating all of this into one is kind of a giant step. Um, I think we, we did look at doing it on a, on a piecemeal basis over three or four years. And I said, hey, you know, every year we're gonna to go to them and say, we're gonna raise your dues this much more and we're gonna add this and this much more, we're gonna add that. It just seemed to make sense to me to do it all in one fell swoop, take the hit with the members that are gonna leave and keep building our operations. I think it's gonna be a selling point in our market for people to come and say, hey, this is what it is. And you yep. get this free and you get that free and you." and you get this at cost plus 20. It just seems to me like it's going to be a big selling point for the club. And the member non-member pricing is a nice thing to have too when you're in the pro shop and you see that you get your price and uh, the non-member gets a price. It's a nice psychological note, isn't it? <laughs> and we feel that, that that'll be a big plus. I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see our golf merchandise, uh, wow coordinating with this we're also doing a rebranding so we're going to have a new logo come out so okay. that aspect of it is going to have a big push probably the middle of next year so i think that's that's another thing that's going to help us but yeah having that price where it says member price this non-member price that um and the members are going to see a decrease i think that's going to be a key selling point of the merchandise program we have another question from Spencer, and it's a general question on the financial viewpoint of the private clubs in the United States. How are they coping with the challenges brought on by COVID-19? Will they all survive, or is there going to be any sort of sorting out in your view? This is, I guess, pertaining to private golf clubs in the U.S. Yeah, um, I see what we've seen so far in the U.S. is uh, uh, public facilities, smaller public facilities are hurting the most. Private clubs that have memberships um, are doing better. Clubs, bigger clubs, uh, are probably the strongest. I would say Oak Hill is probably, you know, it's a big club, about 1,000 members. Um, they're doing pretty well. Hazel Teens a relatively smaller membership. Um, full golf, what I'm referring to. Um, Hazel Teen is doing really well. We're actually building membership over the last year. Uh, we're seeing a big increase in people that have kids joining the club. So yeah. I think that most clubs in the United States, most private clubs are going to survive and weather the storm. Those that are doing financial planning, such as modeling like we're doing here and thinking about the future and how we can really make it, make the club strong going forward. I think those are going to be the best position, but I think you're going to see some fallout on the small end, on the smaller end. Um, you know, the third tier clubs in a city 
are probably going to hurt a little bit. Um, if I had to guess, I would say maybe you're going to see a one or two percent uh, shutdown of golf courses in the U.S. And again, those are going to be the lower end, uh, lower dues, um, yep. poorly managed facilities. Yeah. So not a huge impact on, especially on the private clubs. Okay. And you were saying just to revisit when we before we got on air that um, you're seeing a lot of junior golf coming up and increase at, at your club, which is encouraging as as a sign of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, National Golf Foundation just did a study, and they say that this that COVID, because uh, team sports were pretty much shut down for most of the summer, yeah. single sports like tennis and golf have really bloomed. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that these uh, junior golf programs are going to um, be on the incline for the next 10 years because of COVID. And that's great for the U.S. golf economy because junior golf was on a decline. And if yeah. we can get those young kids in the you know 12 to 17 age playing yeah. golf, that's only going to be a benefit going forward. Agreed. Well, that's a good trend. We have a question from Inda and um, asks, how do we guarantee members will spend more with the new formula pricing? Currently, the reality of the guests are spending uh, three-fifths of the F&B revenue. How do you manage the service charge that goes to an employee with service quality? And when you're facing a price war in the industry regionally, this is specifically in Asia, and we have a lot of price wars going on in the industry uh, as a pressure. Um, when we're facing the price wars in the industry regionally and our members are concerned about the green fees, which we put higher, uh, do you think it's wise we are reducing the green fees, especially on, on a company member's guests? So this is price sensitivity questions, which are a key issue here in, in certain regions in Asia. You know. I think that we, I can answer, I'll start with that last part first. Yeah. I think that, that the Minneapolis Midwestern market is very price sensitive, mm. but I think they're also quality driven. If you right. can provide them a high quality experience and overall the, the dollars and cents make sense to them, I think they're going to perceive it. I think one of the things that has hurt Hazeltine in the past is <clears throat> Hazeltine is very well known outside of the Minneapolis market, but in the Minneapolis market, they're just another club. And there's many, many of those. Uh, you know, I really truly believe that by differentiating ourselves and making us, I don't want to say exclusive, but probably higher priced at a level that certain people are going to want to partake in and providing a premier experience that we are going to succeed with this. Um, as far as the service charge really doesn't affect our service quality. Um, service charge was just another way of getting revenue to be able to pay our employees. Um, our employees, we just, we went from a tip system when I first got there a year and a half ago to a high uh, hourly wage. And as I said earlier, we have waitresses and staff making between 28 and $40 an hour. Um, that gives them an incentive to come to work. We have a number of staff that are on full-time benefits. We're building a long-term staff. And you know, I don't, I don't have a correlation between the service charge and, and the staffing level. I, I don't think that that really, in our model anyway, we don't pay our service charge to our staff. We pay them a higher hourly wage and we've incorporated that into um, our fixed costs that the members are gonna pay in dues. Um, uh, you yeah. Pardon? You just answered the next question uh, from David in Philippines. Uh, have you taken out the service charge? Here in the Philippines, the service charge goes to the staff. Yeah. You just said it's not the same case. Uh, you have an elective in the United States. You have the ability to decide, right? Yes. Um, and, and tipping, and tipping, is, you no longer accept tips, correct? That's. Uh, if a, no, we don't. Um, but if a member wants to leave something for a server, they can but we tell them that tipping's not necessary, that we pay our staff an hourly wage that helps them uh, you know, be able to survive and we don't need to have tipping. If they want to give something to them, they can. So we're not a non-tipping club, but the tipping's not necessary. Not necessary. Going back to Inda's first question, um, we believe that the effective 
amount of their dues is going to drive that spending in food and beverage. Okay. If I'm paying X amount of dollars per month, whether I come to the club once or come to the club 50 times, you know, it, it's a benefit to be able to do that. If I come to the club 50 times and my food and beverage that I'm going to entertain people with is a thousand dollars, you know, and, and I got another member who didn't come to the club at all. Right. They're effectively paying for the benefit that I'm getting from the lower prices. Right. So we feel that that's going to drive business from people that might not have used the club. And those people that use the club, we think it's going to be even more. Has that been a trend line in uh, private member clubs? Uh, you know, we all understand that high end uh, F and B has been on the decline in private clubs in the United States. So you figure that this is, and this is not just high end, but it's all it's a, yeah, figured that yeah. this might be a way to drive people back into using the facility more. Oh, I believe so. yeah. I hate forcing someone through a minimum to come to the club. Yeah. I would yeah. much rather say, hey, you come to the club 25 times and you're going to save this, yeah. which is yeah. essentially what we're doing in this model. Can I actually articulate that? Not really. I mean, if somebody comes in and has three beers, you know, twice a week, I, I don't think that that spending level is going to get to the point where it's benefiting them a whole heck of a lot. But if they come out for dinner twice a week or once a week, even right. during the summer when they're in Minnesota, it's going to benefit them. We estimate that it's about a $3,000 spend in food and beverage over the course of the entire year. And they're going to be paying less effective dues than they were before. You know, and so just looking at the retract casting on those numbers, your 2020 numbers, are they, you know, when you're comparison to 2021, uh, has COVID affected the individual member expenditure? Or has that only been sort of ban banqueting? And how do you, how do you balance those projections in for 2021, et cetera? Yeah, those 2020 numbers are actually 17, 18, and 19 average. Estimated. Together. Okay, gotcha. And we just, we threw COVID year out. Um, okay. We also, you know, couldn't couldn't look at that. Yeah. We also had the KPMG Women's PGA Championship last year, Bump. so that affected two and a half weeks. Seventeen was the year after the Ryder Cup. After, every year, every time you have a major championship, the year after is kind of a letdown, and people spend less money. So we used a three-year average, even though we call it 2020. It's mm -hmm. 17, 18, and 19. I have a one one uh, final point or question that I have is, or comment like your feedback is, you know, you've been involved with the Club Management Association of America for for many years and probably fairly early on, and as a at the beginning stage of the CMAA, I, probably the traction and knowledge of the industry amongst the peer professionals and managers and owners was probably a little bit lower than it is now, you know. How, how have you seen that journey? Because here in Asia, we have uh, a great group of people going through the um, um, sort of process, but the owner recognition of what the, you know, what the certification is actually worth once you get it. Uh, I'm sure it, the CMAA has gone through that process. So now that any major search includes the CCM of any major club, but I'd like to get your feedback from historically how, how it's grown because you've been very active with the CMAA. I, um, I joined CMAA in 1985. So I've been involved with it for quite a long time. And when I first joined, um, CMAA was, the local chapter was more of a social function. And I was a young guy on the block associating with all the old guys. Um, and, and they took me under their wing. They knew what Oak Hill was and they appreciated the fact that I was a young guy at a big club. Um, but as I've looked at CMAA over the years, they certainly have improved and really driven the educational aspect. I believe that, that clubs in the U.S. really appreciate that, that the board members are looking, most clubs are looking at a CCM as a minimum standard to be able, or as a requirement to, to get into the club. Um, I know when I came to Hazeltine, that was a question that was asked to me. There are five staff members at Hazeltine that are CMAA members. Um, they all participate in programs. Three of them uh, and myself attended the World Conference this past year. 
yeah. the educational yeah. values are really being appreciated by the clubs. And I think clubs are, are you know, within reason, they're looking at budgets, but I think within reason, they are supportive of getting education for your staff. Between GCSAA, PGA, and CMAA, we spend somewhere in the neighborhood of $85,000 to supplement our, our staff's education. And the board is behind that. My budget is outlined every, every um, uh, learning, exp learning experience is detailed in the budget and they see it and I have never had that challenge. So I believe that, uh, I believe that clubs and more and more clubs appreciate and understand what CMAA is and are very supportive of, of uh, putting money behind their staff members. And I think that's, that's grown a lot over the years. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a sort of a development out here where the owners start and the, the, the board start realizing, the committees realize the impact of education and having a CCM out here. So that's great to hear. We look to replicate it out here in Asia. Eric, it's been fantastic. Do you have any final winding up comments before we, we close this down? We really appreciate your input. Well, um, you know, I enjoyed my time in China. And when Eric called me and asked if I would do this, you know, it was, it was not even a question. Uh, I enjoyed doing it. Um, I was kind of looking through the names and recognize a few names, but uh, can't really say that I know a lot of people over there. I can't believe it's been five years or four and a half years already uh, since I've left. And anytime that I can help out in any way, shape, or form, I would love to, uh, to be part of it. So Eric, if, you know, if there's anything I can talk about, championship golf is one of those things that I've done a lot of. I'd love be to. more than happy to do that. Well, uh, we'd love to get you on our rota, so to speak, over <laughs> and, 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 and we'd love to get you out here again. And then, you know, we, we do a lot of events once things uh, clear up and, yeah, you know, a lot yeah. outside of China and China. So we'd love to get you out, but That's thank you cool. so much. Really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it. And thank you all for spending a few hours or hour and a half, I guess, with me. Well, you look at the chat, all these great comments. So obviously you, you, hit a, you hit a nerve with a lot of people. So and a lot of very <laughs> useful stuff. I'm going to you know, do some. Eric, I don't know if, if you can forward, if anybody wants that, you know, you can forward it on to them. I shared it with you. I don't yeah, if you, that's great. And if you don't mind, I'll CC you on some of the communication. We'll do this communication and we'll put this also all available, the presentation. So okay. fantastic. I'm just going to do some marketing before we close. Sure. I mean, sure. you know, I'd like to thank you again and, and to all the attendees. Thanks for uh, taking a busy time out of your schedule. Uh, as we know, we're, we're very excited to continue these series and we're, we're going to continue with, uh, uh, we rotate on club management issues and turf issues as is our heritage. So next week we'll have Dr. Thomas Nikolai from the Department of uh, Plant and Soil Micro from Michigan State, and he'll be talking about the ABCs of putting green maintenance. Um, then we'll have the week, at, week after that, and that'll be on October 22nd, Thursday. Then the following Thursday, we'll have Andy Johnson of Sentosa, uh, Jonathan Smith of GEO Foundation, and Anthony Scanlon from the International Golf Foundation talking about United Nations Sports for Climate Action Initiative and how golf can get involved. So that's a little bit of a panel discussion a little bit more on uh, sustainability on a United Nations side. Then on the November 5th, Thursday, we'll have Dr. Fred Yelverton from uh, North Carolina State University talking about weed control. Uh, and then on the 12th of November, we'll have uh, Vijay Kumar Raj. He's a newly minted uh, CCM. He's in, at the Metropolitan Club in Chicago, where many of us know from out here in Asia. And he'll be talking about building membership and membership activity in the city club location, which is another aspect which is very vital. So Eric, thank you once again, and thanks for staying up late. And uh, hope you have a good weekend to everybody. Have a great rest of the day and um, a great uh, weekend. So thank you very much. Take thank care. You again. Okay, All thank right. you. Good night.